Hello, everybody. Um, I have the enormous pleasure to introduce our final speaker for this evening. Um, remarkably without props this year. Last year, you may remember that he arrived with an awful lot of uh, recycled loo rolls, which was possibly the most interesting way I've seen of uh, showing statistics and not showing graphs and PowerPoint and things. Anyway, fortunately, he's only got me as his glamorous assistant this time, so it probably won't be as memorable or as so exciting, but perhaps you'll forgive him for that. Anyway, for those of you who don't know, Craig Bennett is our Policy and Campaigns Director. He's giving a talk tonight, which is slightly different from the title in the programme, which is not his fault, but I am humbly admitting that fault. And the real title is, You Can't Stop Progress, So Why Are We Here? And he's going to tell us. So, big hand for Craig Bennett. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, and uh, just for those of you who weren't here last year, when Joanna talked about recycled toilet rolls, they were made of recycled paper, not recycled another way, okay? Um, so yes, tonight, uh, uh, well, I've been asked to uh, do this talk, you can't stop progress, so why are we here? And you might wonder, why is he, why has he gone for that title? Well, for me, it all starts with a story Cast your mind back to 1992, so it was the year of the Rio Earth Summit, okay? Also, in the midst of the first Gulf War, some things feel quite similar, uh, but back in 1992, and I was, what, 1920, and I was in my first year at university, at the University of Reading, and at, at university, with a bunch of other mates, I set up a, a, an environmental group, uh, we loosely tried to affiliate to Friends of the Earth, but there was no kind of way in at the time. Uh, now, of course, there'd be Young Foe, which is absolutely fantastic. But at the time, we sort of just had to sort of loosely affiliate and were uh, told to sort of hang out with the town group occasionally. And that's what we did, and it all sort of seemed to work fairly well. And I think in around Easter of that year, there was a day of action, a Friends of the Earth day of action, and it was around uh, traffic and congestion and roads to nowhere or something like that. I'm sure there's people in here that will remember all the details. I can't, I'm afraid. But basically, I joined with the, uh, me and some friends, joined with the Reading Friends of the Earth group. And on this day of action, we were standing there, and there was obviously some kind of stall and banners and so on, talking about traffic congestion and, and road building and so on. This was, of course, around the time of the Twyford Down being built as well. It wasn't, it wasn't specific on Newbury, but it was, uh, I think Newbury was a bit later, but this was a more general one about air pollution and traffic congestion in towns and cities and so on. And we were handing out sort of flyers uh, asking you know, people to, to think about this. And it had been going quite well in the morning and you know, I've been getting a few flyers out, you know how these things go. And I was standing there and, and you know how you kind of, as you're, if you're handing out flyers, you kind of glance at someone as they're coming towards you and you start to do kind of profiling, to be frank. You kind of like think, are they going to take this or not? Are they going to be interested or not? And I, this guy started coming towards me. He was in his late 50s, and he just had one of those kind of angry, not interested faces. And kind of just even as, I, as he was coming towards me, I, I actually started pulling my hand back a bit because I thought he's not worth trying, you know. <laughs> but as he walked past me, he turned to me, and he shouted at me, you can't stop progress. <laughs> I, was a bit, I was only 19, 20. I was a bit taken aback. And he basically was just shouting at me and at Friends of the Earth, essentially, for even daring to try and stop progress. And it's something that's sort of always stuck in my mind, really. Because on the one hand, I found myself thinking, well, this is ridiculous. I don't consider we're stopping progress by doing this. Quite the opposite. But on the other hand... I was also very conscious that he was actually articulating a view that many people in society held, and actually still do. The environmental movement is often seen, as, by many, as a barrier to progress, however defined. So it's taken me kind of 20 years or something, but tonight I want to answer his question. I was so kind of shocked at the time I didn't. Because actually the question is, if we can't stop progress, if he's right, and if we are the enemy of progress, the environmental movement, what are we all doing here this weekend? You know, if progress is about the humanity, have we got it all wrong? It's worth exploring, surely, just in case he's right, that angry man. So what we need to do, 
tonight is first of all ask the question, well, what is progress? Secondly, how are we doing? Thirdly, where might we go next? Three simple questions, but surely of profound importance for humanity. So let's start off by asking, what is progress? And I don't know about you, but when you kind of get into these places, a good place to start is the, is the Oxford English Dictionary. Much as I live in Cambridge, for dictionaries, I go for the Oxford English Dictionary. So, my glamorous assistant here has listed up the first definition of progress as it appears in the Oxford English Dictionary. It is forward or onward movement towards a destination. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I don't think that's a very helpful definition for tonight <laughs> because I think when we're talking about society, I think there's very few people that would argue that society, as it moves forward, is ever going to get to a destination as such, at least not a, a planned one that we're happy with. If society suddenly ends, I suppose you could call that a final destination. I suppose uh, you could choose, uh, you know, from a strictly religious point of view, some people might think society could get to a certain destination. But for the purposes of this evening, I'm going to say that's not a very useful definition. Thankfully, there's a second one. So if you can have the second one, please, Joanna. So I'm not cheating if actually the Oxford English Dictionary lists more than one. I can choose which one to use, I reckon. This one, their secondary definition of progress, is development towards an improved or advanced condition. Okay? Development towards an improved or advanced condition. I said that in a kind of Richard Whiteley way. But anyway. Um, and some of the definitions also have this concept of betterment continued betterment of society. So remember that for a minute. Thank you, Joanna. And the interesting thing about this, though, is what I would say is in most people in the Western cultural tradition, and certainly that really angry man that accosted me on that street in Reading, I like to think he accosted me rather than the other way around, still believe in the Victorian ideal of progress. Now, this belief was defined by Sidney Pollard, in 1968, okay, as, and I quote, the assumption that a pattern of change exists in the history of mankind, his word, not mine, that it consists of irreversible changes in one direction only, and that this direction is towards improvement, okay? Now, interesting enough, there's this brilliant book by Ronald White, which is called A Short History of Progress. And I've relied on it a lot for things I'm going to tell you about tonight. And so I'm going to do something very, very rare. Many of you have seen me speak before. Many of you have rarely seen me read and speak before. I don't normally believe in doing it. But I think if you're reading from a book, uh, then it's probably just as well to do so to show you. Because he makes some very interesting comments about this. He notes, uh, this was uh, Ronald Wright. He was a Canadian. And uh, this book came out about 10 years ago and uh, was very successful in Canada. Uh, Pollard notes that the idea of material progress is a very recent one, significant only in the past 300 years or so. Our technological culture measures human progress by technology. The club is better than the fist, the arrow better than the club, the bullet better than the arrow. We came to this belief for empirical reasons, because, he delivered, because it delivered. He goes on to say, we no longer give much thought to moral progress, a prime concern in earlier times, except to assume that it goes hand in hand with the material. He then says, our practical faith in progress has ramified and hardened into an ideology, a secular religion, which, like the religions that progress has challenged, is blind to certain flaws in its credentials. The myth of progress has sometimes served us well, those of us seated at the best tables anyway, and may continue to do so. But it has also become dangerous. Progress, and he means in this material sense, has an internal logic that can lead beyond reason to catastrophe, a seductive trail of successes that may end in a trap. And Ronald Wright goes on to talk about these things he calls progress traps. It's a concept I rather like. 
in a purely technological perspective of progress, progress can be a catastrophe. In one sense, the arrow is the logical progression of the stone. A bullet is the logical progression of an arrow. A nuclear missile, logical projection from a bullet. So you can see how those progress traps, if you keep focused on that one form of technological or material progress, that it can easily end in catastrophe. So I want us to think tonight about what we might mean by a new concept of real progress. And by that I mean the real progress of humanity. What do we think that might be? What would the real progress of humanity be through the many millennia and from this point forward? What might a concept of progress that genuinely considers the physical and sociological, emotional needs of humanity actually look like? Now, I can tell you all now, and I think it's important to lower expectations, we're not going to figure that out in this tent in the next 35 minutes. But for the purposes of this talk, and to be honest, with a lot of nervousness on my part about the inadequacy of what I'm about to do, really, um, and without any time to talk about all the problems with it or to list the caveats and so on, all the opposing views, and there are many, I'm going to talk about a guy that some of you have heard loads about and some of you perhaps have never heard about, a guy called Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Now, groans from some... Some of you are thinking, what on earth is going on? I'm going to do this quickly, because I'm assuming that probably quite a lot of you will know this. Um, Joanna, if you would, please. Now, in 1943, the US psychologist, Abraham Maslow, published a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation, in which he said that people had five sets of needs, which come in a particular order. And as each level of need is satisfied, the desire to fulfil the next set kicks in. So... Now, the interesting thing is Maslow never put it into a pyramid. He just wrote about it. But it's been churned over and worked on by so many scholars and commentators since. And they turned it into a pyramid, not Maslow. But this is still the way in which lots of people look at this now. The basic argument is, at, at the most basic level, everyone has physiological needs. A need for food, for water, for clean air, uh, and to be able to breathe and to exist, and so on. And that those clearly need to be satisfied first. That's why, bringing you all here to base camp, we clearly have to give you food and water and air, otherwise you won't come. It doesn't matter if we give you really clever things up there, we've still got to satisfy those basic physiological needs. Interesting enough, Maslow also put sex into the physiological needs. Uh, I haven't had a moment yet saying it's on offer yet at base camp, but, you know, who knows? Um, <laughs> And then there's the safety needs. So you have to feel secure. You have to, typically that means a form of shelter and a, a, a sense that, that shelter can exist over time and that you and your family and so on can feel safe. The third set of needs are social needs. So you need to feel like you're, uh, you, you've got a family, you've got friends and family, you're not alone in the world, which are very important. I only got here this morning because it was my wife's birthday yesterday. And, you know, I work a lot at weekends and in the evenings, and I thought I really have to be with her on my birthday. So apologies for not being here today. If I hadn't been with her on my birthday, I would in future miss out on some of those physiological needs, uh, like, like food and water, obviously. Um, esteem. The fourth psychological need uh, is esteem. You need to kind of, it's your sense of place in the world. And, you know, have you got self-esteem? Do others respect you? Do you feel confident about that? The final one is what they call self-actualization, which is, you know, do you, do you feel you can define yourself? Are you doing what you're really the supreme being that you were meant to be? This is like, can you be, if you're an artist, are you being an artist? If you're a poet, are you being a poet? That kind of thing. Um, if you're a, a dictator, are you being a dictator? Have you reached self-actualization? These are your needs, okay, which are terribly important. Now, it's kind of an interesting way to, to think about things. There's been huge criticisms of it. I'll get those straight out now. Um, one is actually that there was probably no empirical data that <laughs> Maslow used to come up with this. An actual fact, empir uh, empirical studies have suggested that it's, although there might be some kind of hierarchy of needs, that kind of makes sense, 
Actually, it's probably not these five. <laughs> they don't fall out of the data in an obvious way. Um, other problems with it is people are saying, well, actually, it doesn't work all the time. You know, what about the poet that thinks his art is so important he's happy to starve for it and die? Um, and what about the mountaineer that is so determined he's a mountaineer, he's happy to put his life at risk to be that, to get to the summit? So it kind of doesn't work too much. But for the purposes of this evening, with all the caveats about how it's wrong... Um, <laughs> Uh, let's run with it for the purposes of the evening. Thank you, Joanna. Or just to have it in mind, which I think is really important. And to remind you of that uh, Oxford English Dictionary definition that defines progress as a development or betterment towards an improved or advanced condition. That's what we need to do as we go through this discussion and think about this, is how well is progress delivering on different parts of that hierarchy, both for individuals and, indeed, uh, for society as a whole. Because, to be honest, if we have a definition of progress that is just about technology and materialism, you know, really, what is that doing for us? How is that defining the improvement of humanity? So let's think a little bit more about that concept and that concept of real progress and go on to my second question then. How are we doing? By which I mean, how well is our current civilization? delivering real progress for humanity. Now, I'm always a bit nervous when using the word civilization. I'm going to use it a few times tonight, but I'm nervous about using it because the word civilization is obviously sometimes a pejorative term and comes laden with all kinds of assumptions about what is civilized and what isn't. So, concerned about that. Personally, I rather love the story. If you've not heard it, it's, it's a great one. Oh, in the 1930s, when Mahatma Gandhi came to Britain, uh, to really engage in the discussions about possible Indian dependence. And uh, he was uh, travelling around London and a journalist asked him, uh, Mr Gandhi, what do you make of Western civilization?" And that afternoon he'd been visiting some of the slums in London at the time and his answer was, well, I think it would be a very good idea. <laughs> so with that in mind, whenever we hear the word civilization tonight, Again, I'm just going to be using it to, uh, to describe an advanced, another dictionary definition for you, an advanced stage or system of social development. So let's take our current globally connected civilization and compare and contrast to a couple of previous civilizations. We don't have time to do many of these, okay? There are fantastic books out there which I'm sure many of you read, like Jared Diamond's Collapse, in which he looks at so many more kind of ancient civilizations and what happened to them. And if you're interested in this, I really recommend you read that. I want to really talk a little bit about just one, which, again, some of you will be very familiar with, perhaps others not. But it has some interesting parts of the story, which I want to come back to later on. It is the story of Easter Island. Now, as many of you know, it was on Easter Day in 1722 that the Dutch fleet came across uh, this island in the southern Pacific that was barren, and treeless and eroded. And they actually, it was so in such a bad state that the sailors mistook the barren hills for sand dunes at first. And it was only when they got much closer they realised what was going on. But also as they got closer, they were amazed to discover hundreds of these stone images, these huge stone images, the size of a whole house, 30 foot high in some cases. Captain Cook later visited the island as well and said, you know, he, he, he also confirmed this desolation. He said, nature had been sparing of her favours to this spot. But the big mystery was not so much the desolation, if you like, but of course these big stone statues. How on earth did they get there? Uh, when the, the Dutch fleet got there, they found, found really only a handful of forlorn settlers living there. And... Um, in such a tiny part of the world, tiny remote part of the world, how on earth were these uh, big images uh, uh, erected and put into place? And actually, uh, one of the ways that kind of cracked this was pollen studies. So the kind of pollen studies that now are so important in studies of climate change and understanding past climates were used to try and understand the past climate and vegetation of Easter Island and pollen, doing pollen cores into the sort of volcanic lakes on Easter Island, um, they discovered that actually, at one time, the island had been quite lush. It had been very well wooded um, and lush, and there was no problem with that at all. 
And in fact, when they did further investigations, they were able to discover that the island was first settled in 5th century AD. And over five to six centuries, it built up to a civilization of around 10,000 people living on Easter Island with good houses and villages. Importantly, this civilization of 10,000 was split into clans and ranks and so on. So if you like, kind of different classes on the island. And over time, this community started to honor its ancestry with these impressive stone images that they started carving. After a while, what ended up happening was essentially what we'd now call South Pacific bling. Uh, lots of rivalry between different clans, uh, between, even between different generations, to create the biggest possible stone carvings, honouring the ancestors of before. Kind of reminds you of this race around the world now, particularly among the emerging colonies, to build ever taller buildings, so that you're kind of like getting a kilometre high skyscraper when there's nothing around them. Quite extraordinary. But back then, it was, at, it was looking at trying to build these stone carvings. And these were erected by using systems of essentially ropes and, and uh, trees to try and put them in place. So that as these effigies got bigger and bigger, so more and more trees were demanded and cut down to create these stone effigies. So often it's kind of thought that East Island, it was just a case of simple overpopulation and ecological collapse. Actually, it wasn't that, primarily. Um, and by 1400, there were no left on the island. At least that's what the pollen record showed. Instead, what had happened was the people had been seduced by a kind of progress that had become a mania, a kind of ideological psychology, where people become possessed about constantly uh, listening to their chieftains, their chieftains constantly saying them, doing the same again and again and again, but just doing it bigger and better than ever before, was actually going to be the solution to all their woes. What I've just described there was essentially what Ronald Wright in his book calls a progress trap. And as with so many civiliz ancient civilizations, Eastern Island, uh, Easter Islanders succumbed to this progress trap. Essentially, the more and more successful they were at delivering a very particular material embodiment of progress, the more they eventually brought down their own demise. Incidentally, I find it interesting that scientists now reckon there's such a thing as evolutionary traps where essentially, as society, we have evolved faster than uh, we have physiologically. That, so fatty food and sugary food, for example, are evolutionary traps. Once upon a time, you know, it would have been very sensible for us to gorge ourselves on fatty food and sugary food whenever we found it, um, because we didn't find it very frequently uh, when we were walking around the savannas or whatever. Now... We find it everywhere. Well, not the fatty food so much, but the nice cake and so on. And so, and I still find myself gorging myself on it. So that is there. There, when you see me eat, eating a lot of cake this weekend, you can spot that I am trapped in an evolutionary trap. <laughs> now, the really important point of this, though, was also this thing about what you might call classes or different uh, clans were on the Easter Island population, because. With that social and political structure, essentially power and wealth was concentrated in a very small number of hands. Those chieftains were offering big, broad assertions uh, to their clans that everything would be okay if they just kept building more and more of these bigger statues. And as the gap widened between essentially what we'd now call rich and poor, so things got more and more desperate. What's interesting about this is when the civilization actually started to collapse, uh, the, the remaining people took revenge on them and actually started smashing up these stone effigies in some places and actually turning on the previous wisdom, supposedly, of the chieftains. That's what it would seem anyway from the archaeological records. And this has been noted by studies of other civilizations. I think it's a very interesting thing for us to reflect on. There have been many explanations as to the collapse of the Mayan civilization, for example, but and most come to the conclusion that it was essentially based on ecological collapse over a hundred-year period, but critically one that was exacerbated by the divide between the Mayan rich and the Mayan poor. So I'm going to read uh, another thing for you here, which I think is um, very interesting. See if it reminds you of anything in the world today. As the crisis gathered, the response of the rulers was not to seek a new course, to cut back on royal and military expenditures, 
to put effort into land reclamation through terracing or to encourage birth control. No, they dug in their heels and carried on doing what they had always done, only more so. Their solution was higher pyramids, more power to the kings, harder work for the masses, more foreign wars. In modern terms, the Maya elite became extremists or ultra-conservatives, squeezing the last drops of profit from nature and humanity. Interesting, isn't it? So what, how are we doing now? What about our current civilization? An extraordinary civilization. Six billion people living on this planet. Essentially one big, broad civilization. 30 times more people than, at the, than existed on the planet at the collapse of the Roman Empire. Our current civilization is the biggest, most that has ever existed on this planet, we can be pretty sure of that. The fact that there's six billion people, that's astonishing. That means we've managed to, we're essentially managing to feed six billion people. Okay, several hundred million might go to bed hungry tonight, but you know, there's a lot of people being fed, as many people would look at it. Okay, some people have not got shelter, but six billion people are actually roughly staying alive and the population increasing. And a lot of this uh, civilization is globally connected. We have the most extraordinary things, like for me, the height of civilization, the Doctor Who 50th uh, commercial uh, anniversary special. When you had uh, people in 80 countries around the world watching that simultaneous broadcast and enjoying what surely was the uh, ultimate pinnacle of our culture. Um, I really think that, so if you want to argue later, I'll, uh, I'll see you outside. Um, so how has this happened? If civilizations often destroy themselves, how has this particular one done so well? Well, essentially, looking at le literature, there's, there, it comes down to kind of three big reasons. The first is, of course, natural regeneration, that even when we screw up an environment, if we then go away from it, it can regenerate in some form, in some cases. So although the Mayans did cause a lot of ecological damage, a lot of that ecology has improved over time since the Mayans were themselves decimated. The other one is human migration, of course, which is often overlooked. But, I mean, Europe quite possibly would have ended up uh, not being able to survive itself if it wasn't for the fact that Europe went off and colonised and conquered other countries. The civilization of Europe perhaps may have run out of steam, essentially, and fallen into its own progress traps if actually it didn't expand its borders in, in many respects. Because actually, with those previous civilizations, they uh, went into ecological collapse because they were fixed into uh, particular areas and they were locally dependent on local ecologies. So our current civilization has progressed to what it is now in many respects because lots of the separate civilizations have joined up or destroyed and conquered each other and we're now effectively one global community. There is another one to mention as well which is perhaps an uncomfortable one for us, but we, we need to mention it, and it is fossil fuels. Certainly over the last 200 years, uh, our civilization has stolen energy uh, from an earlier time, dumping most of the problems that come from that on a future time. Um, but nonetheless, fossil fuels, as a result of that, have played a central role, not only in feeding the 6 billion people now on the planet, but of course in, in building that technological and material increase that we the Victorian understanding of progress means. But of course, is there any fundamental reason for us to believe that history won't repeat itself? Each time history does repeat itself, the price goes up. And in fact, as civilization gets bigger and bigger and more and more advanced, so its collapse will be ever more significant if indeed that happens. So let's look at those kind of progress traps that perhaps we, our own civilization faces now. There's so many we could look at. But let's look at three issues. It won't surprise you, I'm going to choose climate change, nature, and air pollution. So climate change. Joanna, if you would mind just um, holding up Abraham Maslow again, please. Isn't it interesting to think about this? Climate change, and I don't need to tell you anything about this here. But climate change very clearly threatens our physiological needs as well as our safety needs in a big way, climate insecurity, and of course, indeed, our social needs. 
directly threatening what you might consider to be some of those fundamental basic needs of humanity. Take nature. Look at what's the impact that humans are having on nature. And of course, now that we've, our civilization has gone around the whole globe, we've now reached the boundaries, the planetary boundaries of our civilization, and now increasingly pushing up on them. We know that this civilization is now guilty of the fifth great extinction. And of course, that again is directly affecting our physiological needs. Do I say bees, for example, and our safety needs? Collapse of ecosystems worldwide, ecosystem services and so on, directly threatening, threatening the progress of humanity, if you take a real definition of progress. What about air pollution? Quite an extraordinary number of statistics there. As many of you will know, it's estimated that 30,000 people die in the UK every year prematurely as a result of air pollution. 30,000. Think about that. That is 10 times the number of people that were killed on 9-11. Think about all the shock and awe and political <coughs> response that happened to 9-11, shocking and terrible as it was. And 30,000 people dying of air pollution in this country now, when we have the technology to solve it, and it barely gets a mention by our political leaders. In the United States, it's estimated it's around 200,000 people dying every year prematurely as a result of air pollution. China, 350 to 500,000. I'm very pleased to see Jenny nodding at me. Um, and, and globally, anyone know? Apart from Jenny? 7 million. One in eight deaths globally Premature deaths globally now, estimated to be, by the World Health Organization, thanks Joanna, from air pollution. If that's not a progress trap, if that's not the system kicking back at us and pointing out that we have to have a different approach to progress, then what is? So then what are our chief uh, progress traps, sorry? If those are the impacts, what are our chief progress traps? Let's start with fossil fuels. Fossil fuels surely have to be the mother of all progress traps. So seductive to start off with, giving us all those benefits that we know about. But of course, with climate change, we now even have the International Energy Authority saying that we need to leave two-thirds of proven reserves in the ground. And yet, what's the political response we see to this? We see that fossil fuel star subsidies globally are still at around one trillion US dollars every year. That's our, our money, taxpayers' money, propping up a system that we know is harming the future real progress of humanity. George Osborne, as Dave Powell has discovered for us and published, has just over the last year alone given out 2.7 billion in tax breaks to the fossil fuel industry here in this country. Let's be very clear about this. That kind of behaviour by our political leaders is no different, really, to those chieftains on Easter Island saying that if we carry on building these big stone effigies and carry on as before, we just have to do it bigger and better, that actually that will improve things. When it's so very clear, they won't. George Osborne is behaving like one of those Easter Island chieftains, encouraging more and more of this madness, a pathological ideology, when the science and the evidence is so unbelievably clear that it's time to say to fossil fuels, thank you, but goodbye. Economics, another extraordinary progress trap. Again, the current love of neoliberal, ideo uh, of neoliberal ideology, if that's not a pathology, when it's so clear, when it's failed in its own rights, as we saw with the financial crisis, and yet now we see our political leaders just trying to put the same system back in place that was there all before. If that's not a mad ideology that's run out of steam, then what is? That kind of uh, economics 
both ignores inequality and growing inequalities. And we've already learned from previous civilizations how growing inequality can ultimately lead to the destruction of societies. And it also, of course, ignores any real assessment of how well we're doing in terms of happiness of humans. So that whole point about how far you manage to go up that pyramid and how well uh, economics in a very uh, neoliberal sense is actually delivering on progress is not assessed at all. The third big progress trap, of course, could be seen as technology. Now, I want to be really clear about this. I'm a big sucker for technology and gadgets, you know. I absolutely love the latest gizmo. I'm very, very, uh, I love playing with computers and I, I'm, I'm, I'm well into the excitement about what will come up in the future in terms of new technology. And we should also be clear, technology has got a colossal role to play in getting us out of the environmental crisis, whether it's with the huge advances that we're going to have in renewables or energy efficiency or so many other things over the decades ahead. But as the pace of technological change grows ever faster, there's a danger that, of course, new technology may come to bite us in our interconnected world. I'll give you another really highbrow academic quote for the night. It comes from a Dr Ian Malcolm, which you may remember is Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park. <laughs> he said, yeah, you scientists were so... I'm not going to do an impression. Your, you scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not you could do that, you didn't stop to think whether you should do that. And surely, as science improves, as we have ever more choices available to us this century, we're going to have to get a lot better at thinking about how we apply the magnificent uh, potential of science and technology to actually ensure it delivers for real human progress rather than just scientists uh, getting very excited and behaving like a child in a sweet shop. I see fracking and bonkers things like underground uh, uh, coal gasification and so on as equivalents to that mad kind of Jurassic Park technology. We don't need it. We know we need to leave two-thirds of fossil fuels in the ground. And it's an incredible science behind fracking, incredible science behind it. But that blinds our society almost to whether it's actually useful, whether it's what we really need this century or not. Just think if all that ingenuity and talent that's put into fracking and underground coal gasification and so on was put into renewables to add to the wonderful ingenuity, ingenuity going into renewables and other energy efficiency technologies. So these are the myths that so much of modern humanity lives by. And yet, when we, the environmental movement, question them, often we are presented as the enemies of progress. So the big question is, are we doomed to failure thereby, therefore? Well, I would say not necessarily. Because the extraordinary thing about the march of humanity in the 20th century, that's the one just gone in case you're losing count, is that it actually led to the emergence of a movement that is consciously thinking and campaigning about how to address and deal with these progress traps that this particular global civilization is facing. There have been so many steps in humanity's progress. The ones that have mattered evolved independently in many different locations. It's an interesting thing. So language, for example, evolved independently in many different locations. Agriculture evolved independently, actually, in many different locations. Basic concepts of law and order, bartering and trading, and many, many more besides. These big milestones in the progress of humanity evolved in many different places, suggesting that actually they weren't just fleeting moments, they weren't fleeting fads, but they were essential to the progress of humanity. And if we look back, what I think is exciting about modern environmentalism is in the 20th century it emerged simultaneously in many different parts of our civilization, in many different countries. You feel this, I feel this most when I have the privilege to go to a Friends of the Earth International meeting. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Friends of the Earth Europe annual general meeting. And that, for me, was a hugely emotional event because there we had groups from 27 different countries across Europe 
and all of them kind of very different sizes, some of them just a handful of people, a handful of volunteers, others with many more staff than Friends of the Earth, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And yet really, something felt very similar and connected between them all. Pretty much all of them are working with community groups and activists uh, on the ground to try and shape changes. All of them came with the same broad thinking about what needs to change in the world. And so what you've seen is that those groups, by a large part, have all emerged independently in their countries and come together within Friends of the Earth Europe or within Friends of the Earth International, and they look pretty similar, really, in the scheme of things. And likewise, we know that the global environmental movement, for want of a better phrase, has uh, an uh, impossible-to-count number of communities campaigning for a better world and for challenging, really, uh, the way in which society is stuck in these progress traps. So that suggests to me modern environmentalism isn't a fad. And I wonder, is it too arrogant for us to wonder whether actually environmentalism might just be the next form part of human progress? Whether actually what we're seeing emerging in now and what we are part of here is that kind of kickback to actually try and the best attempt that we can make to try and make sure that this civilization has, this modern civilization has got a future. Maybe it is a bit arrogant to think that, but I tell you what, it's not nearly as arrogant as those mad politicians and mad right wingers who insist, that despite all the evidence, that somehow we can carry on as if none of this existed and we can carry on with the mad pathological obsession around fossil fuels and neoliberal economics, as if, and we just dismiss uh, all the evidence to the contrary. It's one of those weird things in the political debate, I find, is those people who most rely on science and technology as the sole answer for getting us out of the environmental mess we're in. Those people that say we just need to frack more or we need to use GM foods or whatever. Very often, those same people, the Nigel Lawsons or whatever of this world, are the same people that are the first to have to deny science or dismiss science to try and uphold their ideology. It's a curious thing. So I would say, in summary, the extraordinary thing is, is we, the modern environmental movement, and I say this to that man who maybe is on a street in Reading still, we're not the enemies of progress. On the contrary, unlike the political elite, our movement is the next step in the progress of humanity. We're taking on the real enemies of real progress, and ourselves, we're trying to find a new definition of what progress really looks like, a form of progress that benefits the many rather than just the few, and benefits the many generations, not just the few. The interesting thing is that the modern environmental movement has emerged partly by coincidence, but partly actually because it's stemming from the same drivers. At a time in history when we we're actually first, I would suggest, suggest ever, we we're actually starting to develop a new form of global consciousness. The interaction of communication technologies, people's movements, democratic mechanisms, and global governance structures, no matter how imperfect, offer us the potential to make informed choices about the nature of humanity and how we should live on this planet as if we mean to stay. So our th I think our task, more than anything, is to reclaim that concept of progress in the 21st century and to ask the question, what is real progress for humanity? Why do I think this matters so much? Why was I so keen for us to raise this issue tonight? But it is very simply, is when we're campaigning in Friends of the Earth or in local campaigns, it's very easy for us to focus on just an individual campaign. It's very easy for us to... to and, you know, it's, it's one of those talents of campaigners they have to do. They have to be able to focus just on the issue that you're working on. We become experts in an area. The real problem with that, and I see it quite often, is the more and more someone becomes expert on an issue. They end up knowing more and more about less and less. Not my words, they've 
it's often quoted cliche, but it's really true. They end up learning more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. I often see here in Friends of the Earth, we are, on a bad day, we're a collection of experts all focused on our individual campaigns and not joining up to the really important argument that sits above that, the big picture that is not about fracking, or not about air pollution, no matter how important that is, or not even about nature, but is about the future of humanity and about how we redefine that concept of progress. What we have to be able to do over the decades ahead more confidently and consistently than perhaps we've ever done before is really try and articulate that message and not be on the defensive but be out there proactively offering this solution beyond just the individual solutions of renewables and so on but offer that very confident solution that our agenda is all about the future of humanity and actually about the future of this civilization and not do it in a twee way if you think how well the neoliberals articulated consistently over four or five decades about their theories about free markets and deregulation and how that was going to move everything forward and they were utterly wrong of course but they did it very consistently and so strongly that it's been very enduring. How can we find the narrative and the language that does that job back and claims the P word for our own? One of the most shocking things I found researching this tonight is that actually the number of generations, human generations, between when, if you like, civilization just started to emerge to you know, the very first settlements and early agriculture, to now. Any guesses how many? 30? A bit more than that. You were supposed, you were supposed to say hundreds. No, yeah. Hundreds, thank you. Thousands, thank you. Well, I would have thought that. Maybe I just got it wrong. Um, it's 70. Only 70 generations. I was shocked. Um, 70 generations between the very first you know, human settlements and the emergence of civilization to where we are now. That doesn't feel very many to me, to, you know, from the very first uh, settlers and, and cavemen and women and so on to where we are now. Pretty much globally, really. So uh, depending where, civil whatever you call the starting point of civilization. No, even that, I mean, it's still going back, it pretty much all goes back to about, what, 5,000, 10,000 years, something like that. So roughly around 70 generations. What I find extraordinary about that, we know the science. We know that unless we can turn this around, unless we can reclaim the concept of progress in just the next two generations, our civilization won't last. That's what I would suggest. So whether we like it or not, for those of us sitting here tonight, it just so happens that we were born in a time where, yes, in one sense, lots of material prosperity, but also it falls to our generation and the ones next to turn this around. It has to be the defining moment of the 21st century, the defining task, and it falls to small groups of individuals right around the world to make sure that they're globally net connected into one international movement to do this job. And then we might just have a chance. Thank you very much. <laughs> How long we got? Getting a pint before the uh, footy. On the other hand, oh, well, <laughs> see you then. Well, they've got comments. They've got comments. We can. Uh, Very happy to take a few comments and questions. Or in the bar afterwards. All right, to the bar. Thank you. Uh, Joanna with a flip chart. Thank you.